All right, folks, welcome back. So we are gonna take a look at 10.2 now. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about a different shape, all right? So this goes back to um, the conic sections, but we're just looking at a different kind of slice from the conic sections, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so here we go. 10.2 is all about the hyperbola. So before we go there, let's take a look at a picture of um, what we know so far. So we know that we can draw these double napped cones, which just means like the it's two cones touching each other. And if we took a slice of the cone, that was sort of like this, like diagonal, we would end up with an ellipse. And we learned in the last section that we could have an equation like x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals one, okay? And then before we learned about the ellipse, we actually learned about sort of a special case of an ellipse where maybe we took the slice and we went parallel to the bases. So when we go parallel to the bases, what shape do we end up with? Yeah, we end up with a circle, good. So we've got a circle. And how could we change our equation from the ellipse to one of a circle? Like how could we change that equation? So this h and k, uh, how do we change the ellipse equation to make it into a circle equation? So if I, I could multiply by the denominator, okay. Ah, okay. So yes, we could multiply by to the dominators, but what we're really looking to do is if the bottoms, a squared and b squared, like Antonio says, are equal to each other. So maybe we have something that looks like this. And when we have the same number on the bottom, that means that we're gonna have a circle. And because this happens when we have the same number on the top or on the bottoms, that's when we sort of maybe multiply by that denominator and we get our something like this, okay? All right, so what's new in this section? Well, we're gonna take our double napped cone and we're gonna take a different slice and this slice is going to go through both cones, top and bottom. And when we have that, we're gonna end up with a hyperbola. Okay. And there is one very small, but very significant change to the hyperbola equation. It looks almost exactly like the ellipse. However, instead of a plus sign in between, 
instead of this being a plus sign. We have a minus sign in between. Okay. It is subtraction, yes. That is a very long subtraction sign that I have in there, but I really wanted to emphasize it that when we look at hyperbolas, it is a subtraction sign in between. Okay. So it could look like this with the X in the front and then the Y in the back, or, oh, or it could be Y minus K squared over A squared minus X minus H squared over B squared equals one. So sometimes the X is in the front and sometimes the Y is in the front. And for the hyperbola, it will make a difference, okay? Yeah, so here's why it doesn't matter for the ellipse. For an ellipse, if you add them, like 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2. Order does not matter. But when we talk about subtraction, that order matters, okay? So with the hyperbola, a note you want to make for yourself is that the order matters, okay? All right, so... This idea of completing the square, not going away, very similar. So we're gonna walk through this completing the square and then we're gonna get right into the graphing of hyperbolas, okay? So for this completing the square, we're gonna start the same way where we gather all of our x's, including the signs in front, and we gather all of our y's, including the signs in front, and any constants like this negative 388, we're gonna move that to the other side, okay? So our first line after this, we'll read 9x squared minus 36x minus 4y squared minus 40y equals 388. So we've gathered all of our constants on that one side. We've gathered our y's together. And we've gathered our x's together. Okay. Every time you do a question that deals with a hyperbola or minus sign, I want you to hear me in your head being like, be careful with the signs. Be so, so careful with the sign, okay? So here's where we need to be careful with the sign. We're gonna do the same thing for the x's where we factor out the number. So in this case, we'll factor out a nine. We'll have x squared minus four x, okay? But in the pink part, the y's part, we're not going to factor out a 4, we're going to factor out a negative 4. What's left inside the parentheses? So good, y squared plus 10y. How in the world did that minus 40 become a plus 10y? She's right folks, but how did this happen? Okay, you always wanna double check. If you distribute back in, you should get what you had from the previous line. So negative 4y squared, that part is good. Negative 40y, that part is good. But probably the number one mistake that happens here, people mess up that sign. That is probably the number one mistake. Other than that, Completing the square is exactly the same as for the ellipse. What's my B value for X? Hmm. 
negative four, good, we want to be exact here. Then we're going to take that B, we're going to cut it in half, negative two. And then we're going to take that negative two and we're going to square it. That gives us that plus four, okay? Minus, B equals 10 for the Y. B cut in half gives us five. And five squared gives us the number we add at the end. What should I add to the right hand side of this equation to keep everything balanced? Tell me the number I add to balance the x's and then the number I add to balance the y's. Good, I buy that uh, plus nine times four for the x's or 36. And what do we, add to the other side, good, plus uh, negative four times 25, good. So we've got the negative four and 25, that's the pink part, and then we have the nine and the four, that's the blue part, okay? So we're gonna get nine, parentheses, x minus two squared, minus four parentheses y plus five squared equals, and we should get 324 on the right hand side, okay? Sometimes these numbers are a little bit bigger. Don't panic about it, it'll be fine. All right. Last thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by that 324. And remember, my number one clue that this is not an ellipse is that minus sign. But let's think about like, how do we reduce these fractions? Like nine over 324 seems like a really hard fraction to reduce. So one trick around that is you can take 324 and divide it by nine, right? Do that on your calculator, see what you get. All right, and when you get a number, pop that into the chat. When you take 324 and you divide it by nine, yeah, you get 36. Now, what two numbers am I gonna divide to get my reduced fraction for the second part? Three twenty-four divided by four, good. And when you do that, we should get 81. Okay. So if we were to fully prepare our equation for graphing, we would get x minus 2 squared over 6 squared minus y plus 5 squared over 9 squared equals 1. <clears throat> Where's our center for this hyperbola? Two comma negative five, brilliant. Okay, how far do I go side to side from my center? Six, exactly, because the six is underneath the X, okay? How far do I go up and down from the center? Nine, good, because nine is underneath the Y. 
So the way we read the equations is so, so similar. It's just that our resulting shape is going to be different because of that minus sign. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at how this is different. So when we're looking at the hyperbolas, because we're slicing through two cones, we actually have two parts, two branches to our graph. We're going to have the center. We will have the vertex, OK? So there are two vertices. Now, one thing to notice, though, these foci, are they closer to the center? or are they further away from the center than the vertex? Yeah. So that's something I want us to keep in mind here, OK? That the foci are in the same direction as the vertices, but they are further away from the center than the vertices. So the foci are in the same direction as the vertices, but they are further away from the center than the vertices. So this is different than the ellipse, because in the ellipse, the foci were like on the inside, and now for the hyperbola, the foci are like on the outside, okay? That's one difference. The second difference is when we sketch our graphs, we're gonna have these asymptotes that we'll need to include in our diagrams. And our asymptotes will help us draw the branches, OK? Now, I'm going to not talk too much about this. You can come back to this later. But this could be a really good model to have on your reference sheet if you're a pictures kind of person. Okay, if you're a visual kind of learner, something like this picture might be good to have on your reference sheet. Okay. If you are a numbers and equation kind of person, then maybe something like this is more useful to have on your reference sheet. But ideally, you know how to go between the equations and the pictures. That's really where we want our focus to be. Can you connect the equation to the picture and the picture to the equation? OK. So we're going to jump right in to practice. All right. So for example number two, I look at this, and I bet we can all tell me where the center of this is. Where is the center of this shape? Yeah, one comma two. Good. So right away, we can even go ahead and graph 1, 2 as our center. Now, I know we're in the section called hyperbolas. Why would I bother asking you what shape it is? Because I want you to know how to identify the shape. That minus sign in between means it's a hyperbola. OK? So this minus sign right here makes all the difference in the world. It's not an ellipse. It is a hyperbola. All right. Now, remember for ellipses, I was like, which one is further away? That one is the vertex. Which one is closer? That one is the covertex. For, for hyperbolas, it's a different way of deciding which one's the vertex. Okay. Here's how we decide. Mm -hmm. 
in the equation, which letter is first? Okay, X is first. So the number underneath that That going out three side to side will tell us where the vertices are because the X comes first in this equation. But if I switch them, I'm going to have the Y first, then the, y, the number under Y tells us where the vertices are. So because the x's come first in this equation, the vertices are where the blue dots are gonna be. Yes. So three in this case is considered A. So let's draw those out. From my center, I'm gonna go one, two, three. That's one vertex. And then one, two, one, two, three. That's another vertex. If we write our little equation for that, we're going to get 1 plus or minus 3 comma 2. And we get our center, our center, and then our vertex. All right, well, that leaves, in this case, 16 is 4 squared, so 4. Whoa. Four is going to be where our covertices are. So from our center point, we're going to count up and down four. And for our equations, we're going to have one comma two plus or minus four. And this plus or minus four is from the number underneath y, and the one and two are from our center. Okay. Ah, okay. So whichever one is first in the equation for the hyperbola, that tells us where the vertex is. So it's Different shape, so different rules. Does that make sense? For the ellipse, it's the one that's bigger. But for the hyperbola, it's the one that comes first. Okay. Now, because this is a different shape, we don't connect these four points. We don't connect the pink and blue points together, because that would make an ellipse. But what we do is we use these to sketch a rectangle, okay? So I'm gonna put this in a dotted line. Okay. So I drew my four dots, my vertices and my covertices, and I use them to draw a rectangle. Now, we're going to connect the diagonals of the rectangle. Ready? And it's going to go through the center. So that's one diagonal. Now we're going to connect the other diagonal. Okay. So down here where it says equations of asymptotes, we're going to write that the diagonals of the rectangle are our asymptotes. Now, in order to finish the picture, we need to decide 
do the hyperbolas look like this one, where they go side to side? Or do they look like this one, where they go up and down? Okay. Here's how you tell. Your hyperbolas will open side to side if x is first. If x is first, it opens in the x direction. But if y is first, then it will open in the y direction. Okay? So if x is first, it opens side to side. If y is first, it opens up and down. In our example two, the x's come first. So where these blue dots are, that's sort of the turning point for the branch. We can just kind of sketch them like this. That's one branch. That's the other branch. All right, last but not least, we want to find the foci. Now, remember, we said that the foci are going to be farther away, meaning they're somewhere like outside of the blue dots. They were not inside the blue dots, OK? What this means is our Pythagorean identity is different than the one for the ellipse. C, the distance from the center to the foci, is now the longest distance. So that is our hypotenuse. And it equals a squared plus b squared, OK? This is the biggest distance, so it is our hypotenuse, okay? The biggest distance is always on that side by itself. So last time for the ellipse, A was the biggest distance, but in a hyperbola, C is the biggest distance. So that's why we have to shift that relationship a little bit. If we plug in our numbers from our equation, we'll get c squared equals 9 plus 16, or c squared equals 25, or c equals plus or minus 5. And what that means for us is from our center, we add and subtract 5 from the x value. And then we can count exactly where our foci are. So let me erase my sketches from earlier. But from the center, I'm going to count out five. So three, four, five. And then the other way, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So, so far, mostly similar, but some different decision making. Are there any questions coming up for folks about just this part so far? They're not really two halves of an ellipse, but you can kind of, if that helps you remember it, okay, but it's not technically halves of an ellipse. Ah, okay. So yes, we're gonna go, um, yes, the range should still be from negative infinity to positive infinity, yeah. Um, okay, Richard's question, how do you find the y-intercept of the slant asymptotes when the center is shifted? Okay, great question, really, really great question. So, the asymptotes here, okay? Um, I feel like, we're at an important juncture in your math uh, skills, so to speak. So I feel like in 
like middle school and high school, everyone says, oh, you want to write an equation of a line, y equals mx plus b is your best friend. It's not really going to be our best friend anymore, okay? We're going we're gonna to up this game a little bit. The reason why y equals mx plus b is not really our friend anymore is in order to write that equation, we need a slope and we need a y-intercept. So it's like a point, but a very specific point. What I want us to start getting used to, because this is where we're going to be headed, is we want to use a form called the point-slope form. I know it looks longer. It's not that much harder. It's actually easier in this case, OK? And we're going to be using this in Calc 1 for sure, OK? It's more useful. So even if you don't like it or even if it scares you, get over it because we're going to use it more often, OK? Now, a few things. All we need is a point. It could be any point on the yellow line. <laughs> Well, good, good, they should. What point is on both yellow lines? The center point. Excellent. So this center point is actually our x1 and our y1. Okay, that center point is the point we will use to write the equations of the asymptote. I can already fill those in as y minus 2 and x minus 1. It's kind of like our h and k where we switch those signs, right? So that sign switching should be something we're used to. But now we have to find the slope of the yellow line, OK? So check this out. We know that slope equals rise over run. Yeah, slope is rise over run. Well, from this center green to, oh, I don't know, let's say this point here. Okay, so from the green dot to the black dot, how many points do we count up? Like, what's the rise of this? Four, okay. You mean four like this four? Like from the 16, square root of 16 is four? Yes, that is exactly where that number comes from, okay? So the rise is the number under y. Like that number under y doesn't just tell us the covertices, it tells us the rise of the asymptote. What about the run to get from the green point to the black point? How far is that? Three. Oh, like this three. Like this three, like the square root of nine three, like the square root of the number under x, that three. This gives you the run of your asymptote. So if the x and the y were switched, would the vertices still be the run? That's an excellent question. It's like you read my mind. No, okay? So here's the deal. The number under x will always give you the run because x is sideways. The number under y will always give you the rise because y is up and down. Okay, so maybe let's write that down here. 
If we wanted to generalize our rise, we could say this is the um, square root of the number under y. Okay. Because y is the rise. The run will be the square root of the number under x. It might be the vertex, it might be the covertex, but if you're looking for the slope, it's always rise over run. So you folks identified this really well. Our rise is four. Our run is three. That's for this yellow line. What's the slope of this yellow line, like the one in the other direction? Negative four thirds. Okay, so this one has a slope of positive four thirds. This one has a slope of negative four thirds. So if we want to write the equation of both asymptotes together and we're sort of being lazy, we don't have to write two equations because they both go through the center point and we can just say plus or minus rise over run. So again, rise over run. And that's it. Okay, you have your center point. So you plug those in for x1 and y1. You find your slope by doing rise over run. And then you have the positive version and you have the negative version. All right. Let's take a look at this equation. Okay, so we have 36y squared minus 64x squared equals, wow, that's a giant number. What's our approach to this? What, what should we do first so that we can find all this information? Divide and reduce, good. Can you be more specific? What number are we dividing by? Divide by that 2304, good. Our goal is to make it equal one. That's how you pick what number you're dividing by, okay? So we'll get 36y squared over this big number minus, ooh, a minus over that big number equals one. Okay, now, Shortcut to reducing. How do we find the number under y squared and under x squared? Well, I could take that 2304, I could divide it by 36. If it goes in evenly, that'll give me that denominator. Good, yeah. So what number do we get on the bottom here when we take 2304 and we divide it? Good, we get a 64 down here. We get a 36 down here. And I'm gonna change that to eight squared and six squared. 
Okay, because I, I know where we're going with this. I think you do too, that we need the square root of that number, not the actual number. Okay. Now, I think to kind of solidify our understanding around Christina's question, for my asymptotes, what's the rise? Is it eight or is it six? The rise is eight, good, because it's underneath the y. What's the run? The run is six, good, okay. Um, are my vertices in the y direction or are they in the x direction? The y direction, okay. Because the 64 is bigger than the 36? Okay, so that's not our deciding factor, right? What I said was wrong. The eight does give us the vertex, but not because it's bigger than the six, okay? Eight gives us the vertex because it's first, all right? So we need to be careful about our reasoning here. So I think we can tell we have a hyperbola. I think we can tell where our center is too, yeah? And we could even throw that center right on our diagram. All right, so for my vertices, I'm gonna go zero and then I'm gonna do zero plus or minus eight. Now in this case, we might consider that pink because it's the number under Y. That's the number we've been, or the color we've been using for that. So from my center, I'm gonna go up eight and down eight. For my co-vertices, I'm gonna go plus or zero plus or minus six comma zero. And that's blue because it's in our x direction. All right, what do we do from here? Because we are not connecting them to make an oval. That would be 100% wrong. But what are we doing with these four points? Make it a rectangle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna make them a rectangle. All right, uh, what do we do after we've made our rectangle? Draw our diagonals, good. Okay, should be that both of those asymptotes go through the center, right? That's our H and K. That's our X1, Y1 for our equations of the asymptote. Do my hyperbolas open up, down, or side to side? They open up, down because the Y is first, right? So we kind of sketch those in down here. Here, okay, and our last piece of business, we got to draw in the foci. Now we know the foci are further away from the center than the vertices. That's why we have c squared equals a squared plus b squared. And we fill in our numbers. We know our a is six, a squared plus b squared. Oh, what a nice number. c squared equals 100 and c equals plus or minus 10. And so we can mark our foci here up at 0 comma 10 
and down here at zero comma negative 10. And again, here's our center. We've got our center in all three of these. But the eight tells us up and down. The six tells us side to side. And that 10 tells us how far until the foci. All right, we got one last thing we need to do here, which is the equations of the asymptotes. So as soon as I see equations of the asymptotes, I write y minus y1 equals plus or minus m x minus x1. None of this y equals mx plus b business. We want to make this easier for ourselves. And right away, we can say y minus 0 equals plus or minus, draw the fraction line, x minus 0. Um, what is our rise in this case? It's that eight, right? You all said that earlier, the rise is our eight, our run is six. So if you wanted to clean this up, you could say y equals plus or minus four thirds x, and that would be your equations for the asymptote. All right, questions on this example? Rise is the y. Rise is always the number with the y. Okay, so like in this case, the y came first, but it's this is the rise because it's associated with the y. But if I go back to the previous example, you see how this three came first, right? But three is not our rise because our rise is always a y value. Okay, good. Great question. All right. So again, example four, like this level of question is a good kind to study because you get to practice the completing the square and you get to practice where all the points go according to the equation you found okay now we did this one together in the warm-up um, so i'm just going to write down the equation that we had but you can see all of your work above okay All right, what shape is this? And better question, how do we know? Yep, hyperbola because the minus, that's beautiful reasoning. You don't need to go any more in depth than that really. If I ask you on an exam, like how you know, all right, that's sufficient to say, oh, it's a minus sign, so it's a hyperbola. All right, our centers, we said earlier, were two comma negative five. So. Right. We want to make sure we follow the, the graph lines here that we're counting by twos in every box here, not by ones. Right. But what's probably more important is the vertices. 
Should our vertices, are those the ones in the X direction or are they the ones in the Y direction? They're in the X direction because the X is first. Okay, good. So this number will help us find that. So two plus or minus six will give you our vertices. So let's see, let's add six. So two, four, six, two, four, six, okay. All right, so even though this number under the Y is bigger than six, it's our co-vertices because it doesn't come first. So two comma, whoa, two comma negative five plus or minus nine. So we're gonna count nine up from the green dot. So one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 1, All right, we're going to draw our rectangle and we're going to draw our asymptotes. All right, these opening up and down or side to side? And how do we know? Side to side. And side to side, yeah, how do you know that? The X is first. X is first, beautiful. Okay, let's find our foci and then we'll find the uh, equations of the asymptotes. So our foci here, we know they're further away. So the C squared equals A squared plus B squared. So C squared is 36 plus 81, what that is. One seventeen, and so C is the square root of one seventeen. Whoa! So it'll be plus or minus ten point eight from our center. So this was nine. Ten point eight will be about here. This was nine. Nope, nine, okay. okay. And then our last piece of business, we have the equations of our asymptotes. And again, when we see that, we're thinking point slope form. And we want to even include that plus or minus there so we don't do something silly like forget to write it later. That's always terrible. When you know something and you forget to write it. Okay, so y plus five equals plus or minus x minus two. All right, what's our rise in this case? Is it the six or the nine? It's the nine because it's the one associated with the y, okay? So nine, whoa, nine is our rise, six is our run. So we could simplify this. 
just say y plus 5 equals plus or minus 3 have x minus 2 and leave it like that. All right, let me pause here for a moment, see what kind of questions maybe are coming up. Any clarifying questions? Um, I have a question about the location of the foci. Of course. Um, I thought it would follow, did, I thought it always followed the vertices. Oh my gosh, it totally does. I don't know why I drew them there. Okay, just checking. You're totally right. Okay, let me go back to the center. Sorry, we're counting out 10.8. So two, four, six, eight, 10.8, Yes, so sorry. Same direction as vertices. All right, thank you for catching that. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Let's try a couple of these ones, okay? So the kind where you have to draw the picture and then use that to fill out the information in the equation, okay? So kind of similar to the ones we saw earlier with the ellipse, we wanna find an equation. These ones have their center at the origin and satisfy a given condition. So if we think about the hyperbola equation, it looks a lot like the parabola, I mean the ellipse equation, except it could be this way, okay? Or we could have the y first, okay? Now, just like before, because the center's at the origin, we don't really have to worry about h and k is gonna be zero. So let's sketch a picture for example seven. I know my vertices are at zero, one, and zero, negative one and my foci are at zero, four, zero, negative four, okay? So I already know that my hyperbolas open like up and down. Based on that, I'm gonna choose this one, y squared over something squared minus x squared over something squared equals one. Okay, so I'm putting the y first because it's one that opens up and down. If I drew it and the x, if it opens side to side, then I would put the x first, okay? So what number goes underneath the y? We actually already know that number. It's gonna be one, yeah, because it's how far from the center to the pink point. So it's gonna be one squared. Now, in terms of variables, we know A equals one. What else do we know given this information? Yeah, we know C, C equals four, okay? So if we know A and we know C, how do we find B? Okay, 
If we know A and we know C, how do we find B? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna change that just a little bit, Casey. I think you put it into the equation for the foci, but this equation would not actually be correct for this shape, right? This is for the ellipse, which means that Brian is correct because we want to use this version. Okay? So we can say 4 squared equals 1 squared plus b squared or b squared equals 15 and we could put that number right down here. And that's it. Um, funny story, so my friends, they have triplets, um, and the triplets just turned five, and so they started kindergarten. And they've been in school for like seven days, and they came home from school, and one of the little boys was like, damn it. And the mom was like, what did you just say? He's like, damn it. <laughs> and then... They were explaining to him that that's not a good word for him to use. Uh, they are fraternal. They are fraternal. So it's two boys and a girl, but none of them are identical. Yeah. Oh, yeah, same? Cool, cool. Um, so the mom was talking to the little boy who said, damn it, and was like, well, what are some words that we could use instead of damn it? And the kid goes, ham it. And the mom was like, what other words can we use? Mam it. <laughs> so apparently they've also been learning how to rhyme, which is awesome because at five, he knows how to rhyme. That was totally not the point of the conversation though. Uh, but that's one of my new favorite words. Ham it, ham it. Uh, but then finally they were like, well, could say, oh shucks, that's another word you could use instead of those other ones that rhyme with, damn it. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a highlight of my weekend. I thought that was a fun story. Anyway, um, all of us, all of this is to say that, <laughs> yeah, right. All of this is to say that when we are looking at these, it's really important because the reasoning we use is for specific cases, right? So if we recognize that it's in a, a hyperbola, we want to make sure we use the right equation so we don't get our exam back and we're like, him it, that's not what I meant to say, right? So we want to be really, really careful. What shape is it also means which equations are we going to use? Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do is stop sharing my screen right now. Ooh. Yep, stop sharing my screen. Okay. So one of these days we're going to get the timing right, I swear. Um, here's what I'd like you to do for classwork. Uh, 11. Okay, so for classwork number 11, which is due at 5 p.m., okay, no late, except, no late exceptions, make sure you turn it in by 5 p.m. So classwork number 11, which is due at 5 p.m., is in the 10.2 notes. I'd like you to do number five. And I'd like you to do number eight, okay? So classwork number 11, which is due at 5 p.m., is from the 10.2 notes. I'd like you to do question five and question eight. Okay. 
okay? You can kind of read between the lines and think when you're studying for the exam, like, oh gosh, she didn't ask for one that looked like number two or three. She asked for one that looked like number five. And so that would be a good place to study. Um, and you don't want to only study how to draw the picture, but you want to study like, if I give you this other information, how do you come up with the equation? That's like the number eight flavor question, okay? So we're going to stop there. I'm going to stop recording as well.